Hi everyone, welcome to our first lesson, which is called A View of Life. This will basically be an introduction and kind of a, a review of some things you may have heard before. Now what I recommend is as we go through the slides, if there's anything you hear me repeat or slow down, kind of emphasize, or if there are slides where you see bold or colorful terms without a definition and then I say the definition, make sure to write down those definitions in your notes as well as when you see a question on a slide and then I say the answer, make sure to write those down because those tend to be things really emphasized that pop back up on the exams and that you should be jotting down in your study guides. Now the first big question we have to ask in this Bio 106 biology course is what exactly is biology? So how would you define the term biology? Anytime you see that term, I want you to think the study of living things, okay? Anytime you see uh, uh, ology at the end of something, it means you are studying something, okay? And this one we're focusing on life and one little fun fact that I want to mention is sometimes you'll hear people, you know, wonder about what were the first living things? What were the first forms of life? And it's actually microbes, which is funny because, you know, everyone, when they think of microbes, they usually think of bacteria and viruses that are bad and scary and make us sick, especially in a pandemic right now. Um, but in fact, we would not exist if it were not for microbes, specifically what we call cyanobacteria. So kind of like when you see algae, these cyanobacteria, they were in oceans and out in that water, and they created what was called the great oxygenation effect, meaning they produced the first atmospheric oxygen that we're now able to breathe. Okay, so you wouldn't have had life if it weren't for microbes. So this is what I'm talking about. When you see questions on the slide, make sure you write down the answer, such as what were the first forms of life? Microbes, specifically cyanobacteria. Now, when we study science, such as biology, there are different types of thinking that I want you to know the differences amongst these terms. So first of all, there are two methods of logic that you might use in science. The first one is inductive reasoning, and the second one is deductive reasoning. And the difference between them is that inductive reasoning, it usually involves formulating generalizations that you make from careful observation and analysis of a large amount of data. So in inductive reasoning, you start off with observations and then you start coming up with your hypotheses and theory. Deductive reasoning, on the other hand, is a type of logic that's used in what we call hypothesis-based science. And in deductive reasoning, you're starting off with general principle or uh, laws. So you're starting off with, let's say, peer-reviewed journal article knowledge, you know, facts of science. And then from those facts, you start to come to, to various conclusions. Okay, so if I give you practice problems, which you're going to see like in a minute, inductive is reasoning that starts off with observing, you know, noticing something that you see in front of you. Whereas deductive reasoning will be if I tell you that, you know, someone started off by reading journal articles, reading, you know, a textbook, laws, principles, things like that. Now, when we use these reasonings, you can use them in two pathways of scientific study. There's the descriptive or the um, discovery science, and that one is usually inductive. It kind of aims to observe, explore, and discover, whereas hypothesis-based science, so that's this, this last term here, hypothesis-based science is usually deductive. It begins with a scientific question or a problem, and there's potential to, to answer 
or come up with a solution that you can test. And, you know, honestly, in, in real world applications, the boundary between these two is kind of um, blurred. And a lot of times our science and research ends up using a combination of both. Okay, and when you look at this slide, make sure you can identify if something is inductive reasoning, starting with observations, or if it's deductive reasoning, starting with principles and laws of science. And make sure you can distinguish descriptive and hypothesis-based science. And you can kind of think of it as descriptive uses inductive reasoning more, whereas hypothesis-based uses deductive. Here is a slide of recap notes in case you had any difficulty writing down what I mentioned on the previous slide. You can pause and jot down some notes. Now, your textbook has a practice problem. So in this practice problem, a person notices that her house plants that are regularly exposed to music seem to grow more quickly than those in rooms with no music. As a result, she determines that plants grow better when exposed to music. This example most closely resembles which type of reasoning? Now, when you encounter a problem like this, such as on the exam, because notice multiple choice, so it's fair game for the exam, um, a question like this, you see the term notices. So the person in this practice problem notices that her house plants are doing better under certain conditions, meaning she observes she's seeing it in front of her and as soon as you see that notices or observes where she's visually seeing something that's triggering the science in her that's inductive reasoning so the answer to this problem would be a inductive reasoning now if however i had started this problem and i said you know there's this person she read a peer-reviewed journal article stating that plants are known to grow better in the presence of music, and then she decided to test that theory, perhaps, you know, exposing them to different types of music or something. That example would be deductive, okay? So either version would be fair game on an exam. Just be aware that I can come up with any scenario, and if you see the term notices or observes, then it's inductive. If you see the term, you know, read journal articles or saw a study, um, you know, something that's published or facts or laws of science, then that would be deductive. Okay. If the difference between the two is still not clear to you, or if you want some more practice problems, just send me a message in the Remind app asking for some clarification or additional practice, and I'd be more than happy to send some your way. Now, in order to actually study biology, we always need to use the scientific method. And each time you encounter the scientific method, you may see it written slightly differently, but overall it should include some form of observation, then asking a question, forming a hypothesis to kind of um, have an educated guess about the answer to that question, and then you would make predictions and do an experiment. And ultimately, once you do that experiment, you would gather your data and you would analyze results and kind of figure out, was my hypothesis correct or does it need more work? Okay, is there another path my research is going to go on? And then at the end, reporting results is absolutely critical. In the sciences, if we don't publish what we found and we can't share that with other scientists and they can't replicate it, our work means nothing. Okay, so reporting results is very important. Now, this is another visualization of the steps of the scientific method. I kind of prefer the way they organize this one a little bit uh, better. 
you start off again saying observation. So make sure you're clear that observation is one of the earlier parts of the scientific method. And then what this kind of um, mentions under hypothesis, but you kind of want to squeeze it in above. Um, once you've kind of noticed, made, made observations, it's very important for you to gather information about the topic you're interested in. So in the sciences, we do that in the form of peer-reviewed journal articles. Okay? Peer-reviewed meaning other people in your field, in your specialty, will review those papers before they are allowed to be published. And they'll critique them, they'll ask you to add stuff or remove stuff, and then after that process, it's accepted and published. So before you make a hypothesis, you should be looking into these peer-reviewed journals, kind of gathering information on your topic, because if you've ever heard of a hypothesis, I'm sure you've heard it called an educated guess. And the reason we say educated guess is the educated part is you've read up on that topic. You have read some of these journal articles and you know something about the topic that is allowing you to come up with this formal statement of what you think or what you predict will happen in your experiment. And then you do the actual experimental test and you have to make sure that that experimental test has the experimental conditions and the control conditions that we'll talk about in a few slides. You then gather that data from the tests from the experiment, you analyze it, and you determine whether it supported or rejected your hypothesis. And then you publish, you share those results, and if many different scientists do the same and get the same kind of results, you eventually come up with a scientific theory. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go over some of these steps one by one to kind of get a little clarification. And because honestly, even though you may be thinking right now, wow, this is a bit repetitive. Trust me, the more you hear something, the more it sticks with you, especially with the sciences, because this stuff is going to get um, a little complicated the further we go. So repetition sometimes is a good thing. So we get to that first part in the scientific method, which is observation. So in observation, technically you're using all five of your senses, but it's funny because usually when you think of observation, you think of the one that the, the, the one of the senses that you use the most. And what's that? Your eyes, vision, okay, seeing something. So out of all five sense, senses, the one used the most in formal science is vision, sight, okay? Whereas the one that, used, that you use the least, well, hopefully, is taste. So please, whenever you're doing sciences, refrain from tasting your samples. But for that reason, I always tell people, if you can do science, you can be a good cook because cooking is just like doing scientific experiments, following a protocol, following a recipe, except you get the benefit in cooking of being able to taste whether or not it worked, okay? Now, with observations, you also get the benefit in science of using instruments that can help really emphasize or enhance your observation skills. And in sciences, the big example of that is the microscope, okay? so. For here, when we say what example uh, is the instrument that can enhance the reach of our senses, that would be the microscope. Now, as I mentioned before, your observations will also include doing some pre-research, you can kind of think of it as, which is digging into previous studies and experiments to gather some background information and help you better develop a good, strong hypothesis and better understand what kind of experiments you should do to target that hypothesis. And when I ask, where do we access this info? The answer to that is peer-reviewed journal articles. So I've been mentioning that a lot so far. Keep, it, keep in mind, peer reviewed journal articles. And you can find those in databases like Google Scholar or um, even in the, the 
university library website lets you search through different articles. Okay, and that's how scientists share their findings. Now, one of the terms we keep mentioning so far is hypothesis, and we've already mentioned that another way of saying that is an educated guess. And the reason why it's called educated is that you must have done some form of research before coming up with this hypothesis. And again, when we say some research before the hypothesis, we don't mean that you did actual, you know, microscope or, or pipette experiments. We mean that you read, you read other studies, you read peer reviewed journal articles. Okay, so that's why it's called educated. When I say, what does this tell you about developing a hypothesis? Educated guess tells you that you had to do some reading, reading of peer reviewed journal articles, background research before you come up with a hypothesis. And when you do finally come up with that hypothesis, you have to make sure that it's testable. Meaning, can you set up an experiment to either support it or to reject it. And the hypothesis is never in a question form. Okay, question is separate. A hypothesis you would state as, you know, simply, we hypothesize that blah, blah, blah will happen. Okay, we, in, in that previous example that you saw earlier with the plants and the music, a hypothesis might be that, you know, in this study, we hypothesize that plants exposed to music will grow larger or more robust. Okay, so that would be the hypothesis. You wouldn't say, um, does music affect plants? That would not be a hypothesis. Okay, so make sure that if I give you a statement, you would be able to say whether or not it would make a good hypothesis, or if I ask you which of the following would be an appropriate hypothesis, never pick a question. So now you would get to the fun part where you actually get to carry out the experiments and make further observations based on what you're seeing happen with your different samples. And when you do this experiment, what you're doing is you're basically testing your hypothesis. You wanna see, will my results support my hypothesis or will they contradict them? Now in any good experiment, you have to have at least two groups. You have your control group and you have your experimental group. So we can keep using that example from earlier with the person who sees that the plants grow better with music. So if we were doing an experiment to test that concept, we would have the plants in the same location, let's say the same table, same amount of sunlight. You would give them the same um, food or water, same amount, same type. The only thing that you would differ between your two plants would be that you would have a control group that does not get any music played, and then you would get an experimental group that does get music played to it. So in that example, you can see the difference between a control group and an experimental group is that the experimental group gets the actual treatment that you're testing, whereas the control group does not get the treatment that you're testing. You see that a lot in um, tests or experiments or studies that are looking to see how medications will work, if you know it's good to put that medication on the market. So in those cases, the experimental group gets the actual medication, whereas the control group, they get what's called the placebo drug, okay? Meaning they are getting a pill that's basically a sugar pill. It does, it does nothing. Okay, it does not have the actual medication. So make sure you are comfortable knowing the difference between a control group, meaning no treatment, and an experimental group, which is getting the experimental treatment, whether it's plants getting music or someone getting a test drug, okay? If you're still not comfortable with these, send me a message in Remind and I'll give you some practice regarding control versus experimental groups.
Now, in addition to control and experimental groups in an experiment, it's very important that you understand the difference between the variables that you can find in an experiment. And they are the independent variable versus the dependent variable. Now, one way to think of the difference between these two variables is the independent variable or experimental variable is what you as the experimenter are changing or manipulating. So for instance, in the examples that we have in the pictures here, one uh, independent variable might be the amount of medication that you give the trial uh, patients, the test subjects. You are the one manipulating or varying that. The dependent variable or response variable is dependent on that experimental variable, meaning the dependent variable changes as a result of the independent variable. So in the example to the right on this figure, the independent variable is how much of the medication you give to each of the test subjects. The dependent variable then is the level of drowsiness, how much drowsiness you then see varying in those patients depending on how much medication you gave each of them. Another example of a dependent variable in that same experiment is the histamine levels. So you can do their blood work and you'll see varying uh, histamine levels dependent on how much of the medication you gave them. Okay, the plant example that you see to the left of that, the independent variable being manipulated is how much water you give the plant. Then the dependent variable, which changes as a result of the independent variable, is the height of the plant. So you notice that less water resulted in shorter plants, more water resulted in longer plants. Okay, so you should be able to identify, if given a scenario, what are the in, what what are the independent variables? What are the dependent variables? Now, in any good experiment, you want there to be only one independent variable. You should only be manipulating or changing one thing in that experiment. That way, you then can, you know, confidently say that it was that variable that triggered the changes you're seeing. If you had two or more independent variables, you then would not be able to say or identify what exactly was causing the changes you saw in the dependent variables. Okay, so you only want one independent variable. You can, however, look at multiple dependent variables. Make sure to write that down, only one independent variable in a good experiment. Then once you've finished with your experiment, you have collected your data, which is the results that you saw. So for instance, in the previous slide, one of the things you were looking at was the level of histamine. So you would have your data collection would be the exact concentration of histamine in each of the patients that you studied. Or in the other example in the previous slide, your data would be the exact height measurements of each of the plants you were looking at. From that data, you would then draw graphs or um, visuals to help you better understand it. You would perform some statistics, and based on the trends that you see, you would come to your conclusions. Okay, basically, conclusions are what you can say caused the results that you saw, what led to that data. And then once you've done that, you have to have to have to share your results. And that's critical. Sharing your results, sharing your conclusions, your experiments is critical in the science world, like I mentioned earlier. The way we do that is through publishing in peer-reviewed journal articles, which I've mentioned before. And when we do these publications, it's a very particular format that we have to follow. So first, at the very beginning of any of these peer-reviewed journal articles, you'll see what's called an abstract. 
And under abstract, I want you to write that that is a summary of your entire article. Your entire article, meaning the whole paper that you wrote on your experiments, your abstract will be a brief paragraph, usually about 250 words, summarizing that entire paper. So it'll have a little from the beginning, middle, and end. And the way that you write that whole paper uh, is in what we call the IMRAD format. And what IMRAD stands for is introduction, materials and methods, results, and discussion. Okay. So when you look at a peer-reviewed journal article, the first thing you would see is the abstract, which is the brief summary to tell you whether or not you should read that paper. Does it relate to what you need to know? You would then read the introduction, which is all of the background information. So it would tell you all about that topic to help you understand the experiment that they were then going into. And in the introduction, they would make sure to make their hypothesis very clear to you, okay? Their hypothesis and their objectives. Then you would see the materials and methods because you should be able to read one of these papers and replicate that experiment. So they'll give you their materials and methods followed by their results, which is the actual data collected. And this will have paragraphs stating what they observed, as well as figures and tables to help you see, you know, visually any trends or statistics, any numbers that they collected, or any visuals that they collected, such as microscope images. Lastly, you would see their discussion, which is basically what we were just talking about a second ago, their conclusions. So the discussion will basically explain why the results came out the way they did, what it tells you, and what significance it has to the scientific world. And a lot of times they'll finish off their discussion leading into what future studies can be performed. Okay, so any article that you see in the sciences will likely follow the abstract and IMRAD format. Now, once multiple different scientists have performed uh, various different experiments related to the same topic, and they've kind of come up with the same conclusions or very similar and built this very promising and, and um, strong foundation of evidence, we then end up building what's called a scientific theory. And that basically means that it's a theory of a, a scientific event that has been proven or shown by multiple different scientists, multiple different experiments, and it's very thoroughly vetted, basically. And the reason why I emphasize this is because a lot of times when you hear the word theory, especially outside of the science world, you kind of think of it as just people coming up with ideas. You know, oh, I have this theory about blah, blah, blah. And in the everyday sense of the word theory, you just, you know, shooting your opinions, basically. But in the science world, when you hear theory, it actually means that it has been proven with many, many different forms of evidence. Okay, so scientific theory is something to really to really accept as true and the longer that a scientific theory is around and the more widely accepted it becomes then ultimately it gets labeled as a principle or a law because then it's like okay after this much time and and this much acceptance we can say this is scientific truth basically so when you hear principle or law or even the term theory and science, think of it as accepted truth that has been thoroughly tested and basically proven by multiple different scientists and multiple different experiments. Now, 
We've been talking about, you know, a general idea of biology and science so far, and we said that biology is the study of living things or life. So I want to take a minute to say, well, what exactly is life? What do we consider in science to be living things? So in the scientific world, in biology, for us to say that something actually is living or has life, there has to be certain characteristics that hold true to that thing that we are calling living. One aspect of defining life in science is that they have to be organized. And what happens with the organization in living things in, in biology, each level of organizations ends up having what we call emergent properties. Okay, and the way that I put that there as bullet point is the whole is more than the sum of its parts. What this means is emergent properties, as we go up the different levels of organization, such as from an atom to a molecule now, each higher level will end up having properties specific to that higher level that you cannot achieve with the smaller or lower level. For instance, your body is made up of a whole bunch of different cells, but you can't expect you know, a single skin cell, for instance, to go walk to the store or to participate in this class and learn things and know things, okay? Because learning and knowing and walking and understanding, all of those are emergent properties that you developed at your higher level. You know, each individual cell is very important toward achieving that, but you as a whole have special properties that your individual parts can't achieve. Okay, so when we say emergent properties, that means, once more, specific characteristics or traits only available at the higher level of organization that the individual parts cannot perform. Now, in terms of this organization, some levels of organization will be microscopic, whereas others will be macroscopic. Whenever you see the word micro, that means really, really small. Okay, so microscopic means you cannot see it with the naked eye. You usually need what's called a microscope in order to actually see it because they're so small. For instance, things like bacteria or viruses. Macroscopic, on the other hand, when you see macro, that means bigger, okay? Macroscopic are things that you can see with your eyes. With a naked eye, you don't need any extra technology, okay? So microscopic might be the bacteria, whereas macroscopic would be the gross film that you end up seeing on something that's gotten really contaminated. Okay. You also see the terms of organization unicellular versus multicellular. And in biology, you encounter a lot of different terms, but if you break down the parts of the word, it makes it easier to understand. So when you see unicellular, uni means one, multi means many. So anything that is unicellular is made up of only one cell, whereas anything that's multicellular is made up of many cells put together. Now, when we talk about organization for defining life, we're gonna briefly go through all of the different levels of organization involved in living things. And the smallest unit of life that we'll talk about is the atom. Okay, because that's the smallest unit that's really going to maintain some of the properties of that life, basically. And technically, you can break the atom down into its subunits, but we're going to consider the atom the smallest level of our hierarchy. Then when you put multiple atoms together, you end up with a molecule. Okay, and like we said, that molecule will now have emergent properties. 
basically bigger, better properties that you would not be able to find in an atom. When you then put together multiple molecules together, you start developing into a much more powerful, uh, robust level of, of organization. And we call that next level the cell. And the cell are the, the, the cells are the structural and functional units of all living things, basically meaning cells are your foundation of, of, of life, basically. And there are two main categories for cells that I want you to be responsible for, for knowing. Prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. And that's going to come up a lot in this class. So make sure you circle star highlight prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. There's a little trick that one of my students always use to remember the difference between them. He always said pro no, because prokaryotes have no nucleus, no internal membranes. And the easiest example for you to remember of a prokaryote is bacteria. Okay, so prokaryotes, pro no, they do not have any nucleus, they do not have internal membranes. Whereas eukaryotes, such as your own cells, have a nucleus, they have internal membranes. Okay, so prokaryotes, no nucleus, eukaryotes, have a nucleus. And in later sections of this class, we're going to go over exactly what you find in the nucleus and more into those differences. But for now, be comfortable with no nucleus versus nucleus. Then when you start putting multiple cells together, you start to really see emergent properties and, and the power that can, that can occur in the higher levels of organization. And when you put multiple cells together, you end up with tissue, okay? So for instance, here you would have a single neuron or nervous system cell. And then here, when you put multiple together, now you have nervous tissue. So keep in mind, each level we go up, you get more emergent properties. So tissues can do more things that a cell would not be able to do. Then you get to the really powerful ones. We've now gone up from tissues and when you have multiple tissues working together for a common task, you end up with an organ. So for instance, multiple of those nervous tissues coming together, you end up with the brain or the spinal cord, for instance. Okay, and now the emergent properties, again, are getting more and more powerful. If you think of what your brain can do, hopefully right now as you're taking notes, <laughs> you know that it's getting more and more impressive. And again, keep in mind that term emergent properties. Your brain can do things that the nervous tissue alone would not allow you to do. For instance, me speaking right now. I'm capable of speaking because of my brain. But if you took an individual tissue, it would not be able to speak to you. Okay. Then we put multiple organs together to achieve a particular goal and you end up with an organ system. And you thankfully have a whole bunch of organ systems in your, pro in your body with their own properties, their own emergent properties, I should say. You have your digestive system, your nervous system, your urinary tract system, all different systems helping you to be who you are, helping you to achieve everyday goals and tasks, okay? so you went from tissues to organ to organ system now. And again, each one having their emergent properties. Next, once you have a whole bunch of those systems together, like I said, nervous system, digestive system, reproductive system, all those systems, which we'll talk about later in this course, you now get one big organism. 
Okay, they all come together, working together to make an organism, whether it be you or whether it be a whole beautiful plant. Okay, each of those is an organism. Then we get to more the ecology terms that you may have heard, and we're moving into things such as population. So population is when you have a whole group of the same species in a particular area, okay? So a population will be all of the same species. Whereas a community now will be multiple different species together, okay? Multiple different populations. So you notice in the image here, you have the population of elephants, the population of zebra, together they make a community along with those population of trees as well, okay? Because trees are organisms. So you can have a population of maple trees or a population of oak trees. And together, if you have maple and oak and birch, now you have a community, okay? Make sure you're very comfortable with the difference between those two terms. Put little stars next to it, circle it, so that if you encountered a question saying, oh, in this location, there is a group of birch, oak, trees, and some birds, blue jays and cardinals, what would you consider this scenario that I just described? Well, that would be a community. If I said there was only birch there, or there was only oak trees in a small little location, that would be a population you are describing. Okay, again, if you're uncertain of any of the terminology I'm using, or if I went through too fast through anything, just send me a message and remind, and I will make sure to clarify. Now you get to the ecosystem, the big one, okay? Ecosystem is not just the community, meaning many different species mixed together, but it's also the physical environment. So what you can write next to the ecosystem is biotic and abiotic factors, okay? Biotic, B-I-O-T-I-C, and abiotic, A-B-I-O-T-I-C factors. That means living and non-living, okay? Abiotic means non-living. So now, if you in include the rock formations, the water, the, you know, if there's a lake, a pond, an ocean even there, that's now part of the ecosystem, okay? So if it's just living things, just different species living, that's a community. If you now include the lake, the pond, the air, the minerals, that's an ecosystem. And the last one, the highest level of organization we will talk about is the biosphere. Okay, now it's not just one little location, one small location. It is now all of the earth, okay? All of the earth, all of the atmosphere, all of the living and non-living things on the planet. That is the biosphere, okay? So if it's one small location, one particular location, it's an ecosystem. If it's the whole wide world and everything in it, that's now the biosphere. So make sure you're comfortable distinguishing amongst the different levels Understanding the lowest level of organization or smallest level is the atom. The highest level or biggest level of organization of life is the biosphere. And be very comfortable distinguishing terms like ecosystem versus community versus population as well. Because sometimes those are the ones that students get a little mixed up on. Again, contact me and remind if you need any clarifications.
Now, when we try and define life, what is living? I know I sound so profound right now. Um, we basically want to see the following characteristics in an organism to really say that it is living. And we're going to go one by one through some of these to kind of better understand them in the following slides. These characteristics of life include organization, being able to respond to stimuli, reproduction, adaptation, growth and development, regulation, homeostasis, energy processing, and evolution. And I just want to point out one thing for energy processing, we're going to call that the metabolic processes. And you'll see that in a later slide, but I want you to keep kind of reminding yourself of what the definition of metabolism is or metabolic processes. What that means is all of the chemical reactions in a cell or a body, okay? All of the chemical reactions in a cell or body. That includes building things up and breaking them down. And the reason why I emphasize that is so many times students, when they hear metabolism, they just think of, you know, gains and, and working out or, or, oh, my metabolism's slow, so I really put on some weight. So they really only kind of think of it in the sense of food, but that is not the only thing your metabolism is. Your me metabolism and metabolic processes are all of the chemical reactions in your body. So now we're going to go one by one through the characteristics of life. So we already mentioned that to be defined as living, an organism should have order or organization. And that means the hierarchy that we just spoke about. It should have emergent properties as you go to higher levels. It should be made up of multiple different structures working together. In order to be living, it should also be able to respond to its outside environment, respond to stimuli. And the picture that I have on this slide is plants. It's a plant. And when they respond to their environment, you could actually see them growing toward sunlight, right? You can see their movement and, and the effect that the outside world has on them. And you could even think of it as yourself. You know, if it's really hot out, you start to sweat. That is you responding to stimuli because you are a living thing. Okay. And this can be simple or complex. And a lot of times you can actually see the response. So for instance, you can see that plant tilting. You can see someone sweating or turning red from the heat around them. Or you could see someone shivering from the cold. Okay, so a lot of times you can see in the form of some sort of movement. And a lot of times we end up calling these responses to stimuli behaviors. So for instance, the behavior that you see in that picture is phototropism. Okay, it's, you know, going toward the light. The behavior that you see when someone is cold is shivering. Okay, so behaviors are the responses that you see to stimuli. Another characteristic of living things is that they should be able to pass on their life. Okay, they should be capable of reproduction. Otherwise, the species would end right then and there, and it would no longer be considered living. So reproduction, we're going to go through in more details in later chapters, but for now you can think of it as being able to pass on genes to the next generation, okay? Genes being your DNA. And different organisms have different forms of reproduction. Some are asexual, meaning mitosis. Some are sexual, meaning meiosis and mitosis. When you see mitosis, that simply means cell division. So you can circle mitosis and write it as cell division. So asexual reproduction will only need one parent. It's capable, that parent is capable of splitting itself in two and producing new cells. Whereas sexual reproduction will require two parents. Okay, two different cells coming together to pass on a mixture of genes. 
Another characteristic of life is having adaptations, meaning modifications or changes in those organisms based on the environment that they need to survive. Okay, so for instance, when you look in those pictures, you see the polar bears that are adapted now to the very, very cold environments, cold environments that may not have that much food available. So they kind of have to be able to keep warm and also be able to store fat and, and nutrients because they might not be able to encounter food as much as we can in our kind of environment. You also see a cactus, which is well adapted to their environment, which is a very hot, dry environment. So they're well adapted to holding on to retaining as much water as they can because it's a dry environment. And in order to survive, they need to be able to hold on to that water. Now keep in mind, adaptations happen over time to populations. It's not going to happen to an individual, um, individual organism at once. So you are not going to evolve in the sense of biology in your lifetime as, a, as an individual, okay? It's more populations over time. And we'll talk more about that again in later lessons. So some of the other characteristics of life that you see for living organisms are growth and development as well as regulation. And growth and development is something that I'm sure all of you get to see in everyday life, whether it's the examples on the slide, which are plants shooting up from the ground and you know um, insects and, and butterflies emerging, or whether it's yourself. I'm sure you've noticed your own growth and development from, you know, just years ago, even just days ago. And if any of you have dogs or cats, you've seen the growth and development from puppies and kittens. So that's something very visual, but you tend to neglect the idea of regulation also always occurring. So regulation is being able to regulate the different processes in your body. So things like regulating your body temperature, otherwise you'd be walking around with a fever all the time, right? And regulating the nutrients that come in and out of your body systems. And throughout the course, we're gonna go into regulation and different body systems uh, a lot more in a lot more details in later lectures. Other characteristics of life are homeostasis and energy processing. And homeostasis, anytime you hear that in biology and the sciences, think of that, well, as you can kind of see at the end of the word, static or stasis. That means stopping, very balanced, okay? Keeping things in a good, stable condition. So homeostasis is when everything is going well, basically. We'll talk about what happens in your body when you now go out of homeostasis. So things like disease and illness. Energy processing is also an important characteristic of being alive. And what that is, I want you to think of metabolism. And we already said metabolism is all of the chemical reactions in a body or cell. This includes building things up and breaking them down. And a lot of times this includes breaking things down for energy. So for us, that may mean breaking glucose down. But if you're a plant, that means using solar energy or the sunlight to break down and obtain nutrients. Okay, so for energy processing, circle star highlight the term metabolism. Make sure you really know what that means. Okay, so the last characteristic of life that we're going to mention is evolution. And this is basically over long periods of time, over generations and generations. It does not happen to the individual. It happens to the population. And like I was saying earlier, when you think of adaptations, picture a whole bunch of adaptations building up over time, and that is evolution. And evolution the way we kind of see this and, and describe this 
is the idea that organisms share the same basic characteristics and shared some common ancestors. And some of the same shared basic characteristics we talk about are genes, for instance. So they'll have similar DNA sequences that you can find um, the more closely they're related or things like metabolic processes. They'll have the same or similar enzymes that they produce, the same or similar needs to survive, okay? And, and again, these are things that we're gonna go into more detail later on when we talk about individual organ systems and, and things like that, but that's one of the areas where you can really see evolution, the way certain organs have, have all developed in shared manners uh, between certain organisms. And when we talk about evolution and the concept of, of common ancestors way back when, the way that you can visually represent this is through phylogenetic trees. And the way you spell that is on this very next slide. Okay, so we have phylogenetic trees here. And phylogenetic trees are basically how we visually represent evolution and shared common ancestors. And when you look at a phylogenetic tree or phylogeny, there are a few terms I want you to be aware of. I want you to be aware of sorry, base, nodes, and branch tips. The base, which will be right here, okay, in this case, the base is right here. The base will be the furthest back the oldest ancestors, okay, way, way back, back in the day. Then the branch tips will be the most recent evolutionary forms. Okay, a lot of times they'll be either individual species or individual domains. And then you have the nodes, which are very, very important to phylogenetic trees and any kind of study of evolution or genetics, because these nodes, each of these nodes, which are represented as the point of what I call Vs. So see how that looks like a V? That's a node, okay? At the point where the V is formed, that's a node, okay? Any of these nodes represent a common ancestor, okay? So when you read this phylogenetic tree, you can ask yourself, well, are green filamentous bacteria more closely related to thermotoga or to slime molds, let's say? And so what you look, you see these two guys share a node which means they have a common ancestor, okay? Whereas slime molds are all the way over here, they're further separated, so they're less similar. And one of the things you'll notice over here is animals, which is where you were included. We are very close to fungi. Look at that, fungi are eukaryotes just like us, okay? That's why a lot of our research has has been performed on yeast cells because yeast cells are actually very similar in terms of metabolic processes and pathways to us whereas bacteria are all the way over here okay so we are very distantly related to bacteria we share a common ancestor with fungi whereas notice how far back our common ancestor with bacteria are okay so this over here would be our common ancestor with all of these bacteria. Okay, so make sure you're comfortable with knowing the base is the furthest back in time, the most ancient common ancestor. The nodes are where you find recent common ancestors. And the branch tips are the most recent evolutionary forms of the organisms. And make sure you're comfortable with looking at this and saying, hey, you know, which organisms are more closely related? So even if you were to look at this example here, would you say species A is, um, sorry, would you say species C is more closely related to B or to A? Well, it's more closely related to B because they shared a common ancestor more recently. 
whereas you'd have to go way back here to find the common ancestor. You wouldn't be able to say anything regarding is A more closely related to B or C because their common ancestor was at the same point. If you have any trouble reading phylogenetic trees or understanding their significance or base versus nodes versus branch tips, as always, just send me a remind message. Okay, make sure you are now working on putting together your study guide. Okay, so make sure you took careful notes and organized them well for lecture one's part in your study guide and start thinking about if there's any question you would like to use from lecture one toward the discussion board that you'll have to post in as well this week. Okay, so be comfortable with the study guide and the discussion board. Okay, you can now take a break before moving on to the next chapters. Have a great day.